On the 7th of February 1906 was born the Emperor Kangte of Manchukuo, whose name is Aisin Jiro Kuyi. He was the last emperor of the Qing Empire and he is the first emperor of Manchukuo. Even though of his great historical importance, he is still a victim of many lies and misconceptions about his life. To combat some of the told lies and to honor the 90th anniversary of the founding of Manchukuo on the 1st of March 1932, the Voice of Manchuria has created this video to present a more accurate image of the Emperor Kangte of Manchukuo, our nation's founding emperor and our most beloved monarch. As just mentioned, His Imperial Majesty, the Emperor Kangte, was born on the 7th of February 1906. However, his day of birth is also the death day of his great-grandfather, the Emperor Tao Kuang. Traditionally, no celebration shall be held on an emperor's death day, thus the day before Emperor Kangde's date of birth, February 6th, is set as his birthday. Throughout Emperor Kangde's life, he has lived 39 years and successfully held the imperial throne of two nations. From the 14th of November 1908 to the 29th of February 1932, he had been the Emperor Zhuangtung of the Qing Empire. Within the above period, since the fall of the Qing Empire on the 12th of February 1912, he had been the abdicated Emperor Zhuangtung of Qing. From the 1st of March 1932 to the 1st of March 1934, he had been the chief executive of Manchukuo. To be specific, during the above period, Manchukuo was in the traditional constitutional system. The chief executive was the transitional head of state, post for Puyi before his enthronement as the emperor of Manchukuo. On the 1st of March 1934, he ascended to the imperial throne of Manchukuo and became the first emperor of Manchukuo. On the same day, Manchukuo established and confirmed her constitutional system as a constitutional monarchy permanently. So far, he has been the emperor of Manchukuo, although his imperial majesty passed away on the 19th of August 1945, his imperial majesty's government of Manchuria in exile still regards him as the current emperor of Manchukuo. Now, let me introduce to you the magnificent life of our emperor, Kangte. After the death of the Guangzhou Emperor on the 14th of November 1908, the almost three-year-old Pu Yi was chosen to succeed the imperial throne of the Qing Empire. With his biological father, Sai Feng, chosen as the imperial regent, his first reign as emperor was only to be a short one, as the revolution of 1911 would bring an end to the Qing dynasty in 1912. Hui was forced to abdicate the imperial throne on the 12th of February 1912, and the Qing dynasty was succeeded by the newly formed Beiyang government under Yuan Shikai. Normally, the abdication of one's throne would be the end of most monarchs. But Puyi's life didn't end here. After the abdication as the Emperor of Qing, the Republic of China promised to grant the Imperial Royal Family favorable treatment. This was promised in the Articles of Favorable Treatment which were signed by both the Aisin Jiro Imperial Household and the Republic of China. These articles included the following, but are not limited to Continued use of the imperial title, which is to be retained by the Republic of China with the courtesies which is customary to accord to foreign monarchs an annual subsidy of 4 million silver taels, about 4 million yuan after the currency reform, permission to reside in the forbidden city temporarily before moving into the Summer Palace. Maintenance in perpetuity of the Imperial family's temples and mausoleums. 
continued employment of all servants previously employed. It should be to nobody's surprise that the Chinese government never complied with the articles of favorable treatment and then finally even abolished them. Now as mentioned before, Hu Yi held two emperorships in his life, one as the Suantung Emperor of Qing and the second as the Kangde Emperor of Manchukuo. To be specific, from the last Emperor of Qing to the first founding Emperor of Manchukuo was a process that took Pu Yi 20 years. During those 20 years, four major events made Pu Yi realize that any restoration of the Qing Empire would be futile, that the only alternative would be the independence of Manchuria. Yuan Shikai's self-proclamation as emperor, 1915 to 1916. The self-proclamation as emperor of China by Yuan Shikai was the first event that influenced Hu Yi. During the later years of the Qing Empire, Yuan Shikai was a high-ranking Qing official, general and the last prime minister of the Qing Empire. After the 1911 revolution, and some negotiations with the revolutionaries, he was elected Provisional President of the Republic of China by the Nanjing Provisional Senate on the 14th of February 1912. Only three years later, he would outrageously claim the title Emperor of China for himself, which meant that he had abandoned all his previous promises to the Suantung Emperor, the Qing Empire and the people. Luckily, his so-called emperorship failed to get any foreign or domestic support, so he had to renounce his emperorship only 83 days after proclaiming it. He would die shortly after. Guan Shikai's self-proclamation as emperor posed a considerable threat to Pu Yi and the Aishinjiro royal family. Having the legitimate emperor continue to live in the country would have seriously harmed Guan Shikai's illegitimate claim as emperor, which would have most likely resulted in the entire Aisinjiro family being executed. The Changsung Restoration of the Qing Empire From the 1st of July 1917 to the 12th of July 1917 was the so-called Changsung Restoration of the Qing Empire. This wasn't a real restoration of the Qing Empire, but more of a political move used by Zhang Sun against Zhuang Qizhe. During Huan Shikai's rule as emperor, Zhang Sun was loyal to him and received many titles because of it. For Zhang, the restoration was just a way for him to gain the position of prime minister of Qing if the restoration would prove to be successful. His loyalty lay with himself and not the emperor of Qing. This can be seen at the end of his restoration, as he fled the city on his own the moment his little restoration appeared to be failing, regardless of whether the emperor would live or die. So because this restoration was more in the interest to increase Chang Sung's personal power during the warlord area, rather than out of support and loyalty to the former Qing Empire, this restoration is more commonly known as the Chang Sung restoration of the Qing Empire. Peking coup, 1924. Shortly after the restoration, Feng Zhuxiang marched his troops into the Forbidden City and forced the emperor, under threat of his life, to leave the Forbidden City. The Republic of China used that to seize the Forbidden Cities and all its properties inside. This brought a de facto end to the Articles of Favorable Treatment which the government of China never even once valued. The looting of the Eastern Mausoleum, 1928. The final straw for Puyi was the looting of the Eastern Mausoleum in 1928. There, the mausoleum was robbed by Sun Tianjin and his men in a cruel display of barbarism. Soldiers made their way into the tombs and opened the coffins of the Qianlong Emperor, his two empresses, and three concubines. While the valuables were looted, the skeletons were thrown into the mud and humiliated. 
They even dishonored the grave of Empress Dowaga Xixi by stealing her imperial robes, tearing off her undergarments, shoes and socks, and taking all the pearls and jewels from her body. The looters even pried open her jaws and took the rare power from her mouth. The bodies of Puyi's ancestors were desecrated and the mausoleum was almost entirely destroyed. Such a disgusting act of brutality was entirely ignored by Chiang Kai-shek, even though grave robbing was a brutal crime in the Republic of China. Not just that, Chiang Kai-shek openly indulged Sun Qianjing's brutal act. The mausoleum was only restored after Puyi and many Qing loyalists paid for it themselves. To summarize, these four major events made it clear to Puyi that the current situation posed a considerable threat to his and his family's well-being. It was during that time that many Chinese warlords and Chiang Kai-shek incited the masses against the royal family, even advocating the idea of killing the emperor. Puyi had developed the thought of leading the Manchurian independence movement. When the Manchurian incident broke out in September 1931, he realized that the chance of an independent Manchurian state had come. The early years of Manchukuo, also known as the Datong era, were a new beginning for Manchuria. The start of an era of great prosperity, economic growth and increase of living standards. This change was supervised by Puyi as the chief executive of Manchuria. It would take Puyi another two years to be again proclaimed as an emperor. Not as an emperor of Qing, but as the first emperor of Manchukuo. No longer would he be the Suantung emperor. From that day forward, the only title Puyi held was that of the Kangde emperor of Manchukuo. Manchukuo was supposed to be a new beginning for the Manchurian people and it was planned to be a shining monument of the true meaning of East Asian morality and the first step towards the creation of a new and better East Asia. For that to happen, Manchukuo needed to industrialize and modernize in record time. The barriers left over by the old Qing and the Chang's warlord regime needed to fall and be replaced with a modern and functioning system. By taking inspiration of Japan's earlier success of transforming their country from the mostly agricultural and traditionalist Japan of the old shogunate era to the fully industrialized Japan of the 1930s, the Manchurian government was able to speed up the process, but the task ahead would still be of monumental challenge for the young nation. But even with that challenge, Manchukuo's industrialization sped forward in record pace. With the help of the brotherly state of Japan, cities shot out of the ground, schools were built, the old streets were repaved with asphalt, and in major cities, water and electricity became common in almost every household. Railways connected even the most rural and isolated parts of Manchukuo. For the first time in history, the journey from Xinqing to Fusan was able to be completed in just over a single day. Manchukuo was in all aspects one of the most industrialized countries in East Asia. The shops were filled with the luxury wares from Japan. Factories produced steel, cement and textile that were to be transported to the harbors for exports around the world alongside with coal and aluminum. Manchurian fields stretched miles in every direction, growing soy, wheat, or were used to house livestock. While most Chinese farmers still relied on traditional farming methods, Manchurians used a variety of innovative and modern farming equipment from Japan. Compared to the hardship, to the constant infighting and exploitation of Chinese warlords, life in Manchukuo at the time was extremely comfortable and peaceful. Yet there were those that were jealous of Manchuria's great progress towards prosperity. Then a strong, independent and prospering Manchuria would be the end for all Chinese chauvinistic dreams to forcefully incorporate Manchuria into China. For Manchuria to be Chinese, the Manchurian had to suffer. 
for Manchurians to suffer, they needed to fear their own countryside. And for that to happen, the Chinese and their puppet master, the Soviets, took it to themselves to fund and arm all sorts of bandits and rabble that would terrorize the rural areas of Manchukuo, burning, raping and plundering the farms of innocent civilians just trying to make a living for themselves. And so was it that the Kangde Emperor had to face another challenge early on. The pacification of the bandits had to be Manchuria's goal number one if it wanted its other goals to succeed. With the signing of the Japan Manchukuo Protocol on the 15th of September 1932, the first step was done for Manchukuo's continued existence in the world. Securing an everlasting alliance with the Japanese ensured an everlasting friendship for the Manchurian people. It stated the following. In accordance with that Japan recognizes the establishment of a free and independent Manchukuo based on the free will of its inhabitants. In accordance with that Manchukuo has declared its intention of abiding by all international agreements pledged by the Republic of China. The government of Japan and the government of Manchukuo have established a perpetual, friendly and neighborhoodly relationship, mutually guaranteeing each other's sovereignty for the peace of East Asia. In 1934, Puyi took it to himself to be the leader the Manchurian people needed. He was to be the emperor that would uphold justice and the kingly way in Manchukuo. The KMT government was so hopelessly corrupt and the people suffered because of it. The so-called Republic of China didn't care about the democratic will of the people and was more of a playground for powerful generals to boost their personal power and wealth, a problem that couldn't be allowed to exist in Manchukuo. The will of the people was needed for Puyi to rule over Manchukuo. Manchuria wouldn't be governed by the will of just one ethnic group, but all ethnic groups were supposed to be involved in the government. During those years, Puyi visited mines, factories and schools to build a connection with the people of Manchuria. In a rather touching story, we can see the high respect and admiration that Puyi received from the people of Manchukuo. During a regular visit, Puyi went forward and thanked a foreman of a coal mine personally for his extraordinarily good job, which made him break out in tears of joy for this great honor. Here we can see that this baseless claim that Hu Yi ruled over a country that hated him is pure fabrication. The Aishin Jiro family has ruled over Manchuria for centuries and the people there were loyal to the former Qing. This loyalty was extended to the new government under Pu Yi. To believe the loyalty and devotion towards the emperors of the Aishin Jiro clan would simply vanish to be replaced with them newly created loyalty towards the corrupt Chinese Republic that was struggling to keep their nation in any form of order is ridiculous if you think about more than a few seconds. The people loved the emperor and he loved the people as much as the father could love his own son. In 1935, Pui as newly crowned emperor of Manchukuo went on his first visit to Japan. There, his goal was to strengthen Manchurian-Japanese relations with the Japanese Emperor Hirohito. During that time, the two discussed the future of cooperation between the two countries. It was during that time that both emperors developed a mutual respect for one another. The two emperors developed a bond between themselves that was like those of brothers. After his visit, Hui returned to Sinking to continue his work as emperor. On return, Puyi wrote the imperial edict of returning home palace and teaching the people. To think deeply from the founding of the country to the present, all of Manchukuo has been relying on the efforts from the Empire of Japan based on their spirit of upholding justice. I am fortunate to extend my sincerity to Japan as well observe Japan more attentively knowing that her political foundation 
is based on humanity and love, while her educational foundation emphasizes and loyalty and filial piety. The Japanese people respect their monarch and love their emperor, regarding him as their heaven and their earth. None of them is not loyal to serve their emperor and nation. All of them are sincere to their country. Therefore, the Japanese can secure their nation and defend there from their foreign enemies, be trustworthy and compassionate to their neighbors so that they can maintain their unbroken imperial line. I and the Emperor of Japan are spiritually as one. You subjects shall respectfully realize that. We can see here that the friendship between the two nations started to blossom until it eventually evolved in the unbreakable bond of two brotherly states. Two years later, the Second Sino-Japanese War would break up. With Japan being forced into a war with China, Hui honored his treaties with Japan and supported the war effort. Manchuria joined the war on Japan's side but took on a more passive role supplying Japan more with weapons, ammo, food and planes instead of sending divisions to the front lines. Hui, at first enthusiastic about the early success during the war, quickly turned saddened of the realization how the people of Manchuria and Japan slowly suffered more and more through the harsh strain of the war economies of both countries. To keep moral high, Hui tried to increase the number of public appearances which sadly wasn't always possible. This didn't prevent Puyi from visiting Japan a second time on the 7th of June 1940 to celebrate the 2600th birthday of Japan. There he was welcomed again by the Emperor of Japan. About a month later, Puyi established the nation founding shrine in Manchukuo to honor the founding kami of Manchukuo, Amaterasu Omikami. On the 10th anniversary of the founding of Manchukuo, on the 1st of March 1942, we have Emperor Kangde's first time ever calling Japan Manchukuo's brotherly state. This could be found in the imperial edict of the 10th anniversary of the founding of Manchukuo. This was a great day of celebrations in Manchuria. Thousands of civilians went to the streets to watch the celebrations unfurl. Parades of Japanese and Manchurian soldiers celebrate both the founding of the nation and from Japan, Prince Takamatsu visited Manchukuo to represent his government. As the war turned more and more against the Japanese, with the entry of the US into the war, the situation in Manchuria grew uncertain and the threat of a possible Soviet invasion increased. So it came to be that the Soviets invaded Manchuria in 1945, bringing a collapse to the overstretched Japanese and Manchurian armies defending the Amur River. The armies tried to buy time for civilians to evacuate in the south of Manchuria, but it was futile. Manchukuo fell in less than a month and a dark shadow laid itself upon East Asia. Manchurian politicians were dragged out of their homes and hung in the streets. Soldiers loyal to the emperor were butchered by Soviet-backed communists and Manchurians who resisted the brutality were shot on sight. The streets of the once so safe Manchukuo were an anarchy following the chaos planted by the communists. It would create scars that Manchukuo never healed from. You may ask yourself, what did the emperor do during that time? Well. Once the Soviet invasion started, plans were set in motion for Puyi to be evacuated to Japan. Such plans were somewhat delayed as Puyi demanded that civilians would be allowed to evacuate before him. This led ultimately for Puyi to be captured on a Manchurian runway before the plane to Japan could take off. This was on the 19th of August 1945. It was also the day the Emperor Kangde died. The person that continued living was but a broken shell of a man, broken by the repeated loss of his empire, 
his country, his people, and through the torture and indoctrination of the communists. It was better for them to break Puyi instead of giving him the mercy of dying with honor. He became a victim of communist lies and propaganda. Lies that stick with him till this day. But why do these lies exist? Why does the Chinese care so much about some unimportant puppet state that they constantly have to point out how fake the country truly was? It is simple. It is because they fear Manchukuo. They fear the fragile lie they created after the war. Because when this lie breaks, the people living under CCP rule will realize that they have been lied to. Because if Manchukuo wasn't a cruel and unjust as Chinese always claim, it will reveal that the true monster in Manchuria wasn't Japan, but the communists in China. China is a country built on lies, lies so fragile that if they break, the country's legitimacy in the eyes of the world will shatter. And the lie about Manchukuo, the lie about Aisi Jiro Puyi, the great Kangda emperor who founded Manchukuo and led it to unprecedented prosperity, wealth and freedom, who was a loving father to all his subjects, a beacon of honor, dignity, the embodiment of hope holding justice and the King Li Wei, is without a doubt China's biggest lie and a lie that is ready to be destroyed.